This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit, the free online repair manual for everything. Before you start your next build or fix, head over to iFixit.com and check out their high quality parts, tools, and guides. For $5 off your purchase of $10 or more, go to iFixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. Today on Know How, tech keeps on spinning, spinning, spinning into the future. know-how. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and fusion. I'm Father Robert Ballasare. I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be opening up that jar of knowledge like the old piggy bank and pouring it into your head like a big old coin star in the sky. That's right. And then once we put that knowledge in there, we're going to twist it up and seal it for good. That's right. This is what you get, folks, here on Twitch TV. Sealed knowledge. That's right. We're going to start selling it. I don't know. I don't know how this is supposed to work out, but okay, Brian, this yeah. is sort of a fun episode. We wanted to do something that was going to be just kind of goofy, something mm -hmm. that looked at some of the cool technology that we've enjoyed. And yes, we finally gave into it. I'm sorry, folks. After a lot of requests, yeah, we made ourselves is, some spinners. This has hit what? Peak Peak spin. Peak spin. Peak, peak hype. Peak fad. Yeah. Peak all of that stuff. I mean, stuff. we've all been through that. Uh, I'm sure when you were growing up, it was, uh, what is it, where you push the hoop with a stick? That no, was it was a rock. We didn't even add the hoop. It, it was, was a, rock. a rock. You just kick a rock. It wasn't and even pet rock yet. Was, no, no. That was that was like a way advanced. When I was future. growing up, it was Tamagotchis and Pogs. I remember those. I yeah. remember those. Yeah. yeah. And actually, uh, when I was in uh, college, uh, the, <laughs> the thing was spinning your pen. So it, there was a spinning yes. thing, but it was... And you got good enough to just like continuously spin, spin your pen, pen on your finger, right? I yeah, mean, that, yeah. Was, that was the thing. Kind of like a drummer does. A, a fidget yeah. widget. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of us have ADD. I mean, I did growing up, and that's why I needed projects to focus on for most of my attention. But uh, generally, yeah, I would, I would always needed something to fidget with in my hand. Right. Now, you could. You could do yourself a solid by going out and buying a fidget widget. And you could probably <laughs> buy a really nice one for like 7 to $10. But here at Know How, we say, why? Why build? Why buy one for seven to ten dollars when you could build one for like thirty? That's right. As long as you have a three D printer, <laughs> <laughs> that is the initial uh, cost of like three hundred dollars. Right. So really, it's like three hundred and thirty. And uh, if you have a three D printer laying around, this is a fun project to do with it. Uh, but see, really, this is a, a backdoor way into doing a project that I've been wanting to do for a while, and that oh. is a magnetic accelerator. So uh. what we're building now is the first stage in something that will be actually pretty cool and hopefully you'll build along with us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that. Now, Brian and I did have a little build-off challenge. Unfortunately, um, we ran into some issues. His printer uh, was is the oldest one we've ever had on Know How, so it wasn't really up to snuff. It didn't have the resolution that he it's needed. Like, was it the first one that we that played with? That was the with? very first one that we played so with. So it was about three years ago. It was uh, the XYZ Da Vinci one. Point oh, yeah, and uh, the resolution on that 3D printer isn't the best. So when we were having our, our build off, you're using the mono price Maker uh, Select, which is awesome. Select. I love the resolution. I got that thing dialed in. Unfortunately, yesterday it broke. <laughs> like bigly broke. But we should preface you've been what uh, printing a solid forty five 40, days. Forty five days. So that's which, not how long I've had it. That's, that's how long it's been printing. Hours. Yeah. So. Four times 45. So it's yeah. been printing a long... I've, I ride my 3D printers really, really hard. I actually broke two of the monoprice. One of them, the hot end is malfunctioning, and the other, the bed is malfunctioning. So I'm thinking today... You just swap parts. I could just swap them over yeah. and make one good one, but I didn't have time to do that last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I did have time to uh, do a couple of different prints for my spinner uh, with the the Da Vinci. I mean, each print took about 30 minutes. Right. And uh, we're going to go through some of the parts that you're going to need for this project. Burke, make sure that you've got my uh, my computer on the TriCaster or available for the TriCaster because at some point I'm going to switch over to the 3D design. But let's let's kick it off first with some of the things that you're going to need to be able to put this thing together. And, and by the way, when we said $30, that's what you have to do to buy the parts in bulk realistically, each one of these spinners, if you have a 3D printer, is going to cost you something like four bucks, three bucks. Yeah. It's just the fact that you have to buy a lot of stuff because they don't sell just a bearing right. or you know, just a, a uh, little right. hub. 
So you're going to be building a lot of them, and then you can give them away as gifts. Or That's something. what I've been doing. Yeah, I've I've made like twelve of these so far. With that design, you're going to stick oh. with that one. Oh, so it's on. <laughs> it's on. It's a spinoff. <laughs> You know, you're not so young anymore. You could get yourself hurt. That's true. That's true. I could pull a muscle spinning. <laughs> okay. So the first thing that we're going to need, this is this is the key, is an unlubricated bearing. And Burke, we actually, if you could go to the Amazon webpage for this, this is not just any 22 millimeter bearing. Uh, you need one that, that doesn't have any lubricant whatsoever. No oil, no graphite, uh, no um, molybdenum. That, yeah, no, none of that grease. Uh, the reason for that is because you want something that's going to free spin. It's not going to have to bear a lot of load, so it's not going to build up a lot of heat from friction. But if you don't get the unlubricated ones, what's going to happen is it's just not going to spin right. Right. And I think also it might be worth saying, um, explain what a bearing is and how it functions. Because uh, uh, I know from Burke, who's who thankfully is TDing for us tonight, uh, there's wheel bearings that you yes. have in your motorcycle or your mm -hmm. car. Uh, engines use bearings. A lot of different things use bearings. It's basically a way of creating a very low friction way of spinning something on an axis. Precisely. So there's inside of the bearing are little balls that push against the wall of the outside wall of the bearing mm -hmm. and then in the inside and it allows it to spin freely. Yeah. And so what we have here, I'll, I'll oh, I send guess that you one your way, is I bought a pack of eight uh, and this actually is enough for eight spin because I only need this for the center bearing. The center bearing is the only one that needs to be really low on friction. And you can notice it's it's open wall, so you can see exactly how it works. You've got small balls between two rings, and it allows those rings to slip past each other relat relatively easily. But again, the key is there is no grease, no lubrication, right. nothing that's going to get gummed up. Now so the, this this one doesn't have it, but the, the other ones have shields around them. Precisely. So the, this is... Uh, yeah, actually, you, you've got one there. This is the other type of bearing I would suggest you buy. These are 22 millimeter skate bearings. And uh, Burke, if you go, we've got a, a link for this. These are about 10 bucks for a pack of 16 versus 10 bucks for a pack of eight for the unlubricated bearings. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that you want to just provide weight. Uh, I see. Now, you could bypass this. If you've got something that weighs, that you know, it's metallic, that's pretty dense, lead weights. And, and this is important that you can guarantee will be the same weight for each and every single one, mm -hmm. go ahead and use that. But these are relatively cheap. I mean, this is not going to cost me a whole lot of money, right. and it guarantees me that I'm going to be using the right weight. <laughs> That's important, because as you yes. spin these things, the, if it's off by you know a fraction of weight, it's going to just oscillate, and it's not going to have that smooth spinning effect that we're looking for. Right. Oh, you could stop there. You could go ahead and just get yourself the unlubricated bearing, plus the skate bearings and uh, and create yourself a spinner if you've got a 3D printer. But we went one step further because this, this will work, but what makes it really, really cool and what will make it work for our magnetic accelerator project later on in the summer is this. Burke, if you go to that third link, this is a fidget spinner. It's a cap. So basically what this will do is this will give you a place to put your fingers on the bearing mm -hmm. And the reason why they're important is because with our little cradle for a magnetic spinner that you're going to see later on, this is actually what holds it. This is what's going to allow it to stay centered, uh, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, because you want a, basically a little way of displaying it, right? Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, what what good is it if your bearing isn't show offable? <laughs> right. As pointless as this project is, why make it less pointless without being able to show it off? <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the designs that Brian and I were bantering back and forth with. <laughs> Rick, if you go ahead and go to my computer, um, I made a couple of designs here uh, and I'm going to show you the simple spinner. Now, all of these are going to be using a 22 millimeter diameter bearing. That's what I've built them around. And, and this is what it looks like. I've made a four spoke just because, here's the thing. If you increase the amount of mass in the outside ring mm -hmm. and you can create a, a device with a low enough friction bearing, it will actually spin a lot longer. You're, you're, you're putting more energy into the system, which means there's more energy to bleed out. Right. So this will spin longer than a, a unit with three bearings. And also it's, it's easier to balance because it, if you do three bearings, you have to make sure they are offset by a hundred and uh, what is it? 108, uh, 20 uh, degrees each. Yeah. yeah. 120 degrees each. 
It took a little, when I was working with Tinkercad, it reminded me of like how far it's come, but also how limited it is yeah. at the same time. Because if you start moving things at those angles, when I was doing my, my three prong yeah. uh, attempt, it took me a couple tries to get the angles right. I, I actually, when I made my three prong, uh, cause I made a fancy three prong that mm -hmm. actually had like curved uh, tines out to the oh, bearings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I ditched Tinkercad. So what I did was I actually used Autodesk. Mm -hmm. And what you could do is you could build one. So build the center and then the uh, the outside spoke. Right. And then copy it and rotate it 120 degrees. Copy it, rotate it 120 degrees, and you're right. done. So that's definitely an instance where Tinkercad met its limitations. But with a four-spoke design, mm -hmm. uh, this fits in perfectly. So I also noticed in your design, you have uh, holes in the center of the braces. I'm yeah. I'm thinking that's uh, one aesthetic, but two, that uh, when you place something like that in a beam on a 3D printer, doesn't that add a little bit extra uh, strength and reduce the amount of filament that you use? It does. So it re definitely reduces the amount of filament. But also, as you mentioned, we, we discovered this very early on. You can actually increase the strength of a 3D printed part by taking away material. What this does, it actually creates another plane, it's like a another, plane of strength it's inside. It's like having an arch. Correct, right. Yeah. It's just, it will, it will, it will eventually snap, yeah. but it will snap at a much higher torque than it would if it was a, a, a solid piece. Mm -hmm. And we've actually tested this. I, I didn't believe it at first, but it is a sound physical principle. So folks, if you can, I mean, don't take away all the material, but take mm -hmm. away the material where you can. In this particular case, and uh, if you go back to my mm -hmm. computer, Burke, You'll notice that where I took out the material, there you go. If you where I took out the material it was very close to the hub. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I did that is I want the weight to be on the outer rim. Weight on right. the inner hub doesn't help me any. Right. Uh, now here's here's actually something else that you should be using for Tinkercad. Uh, once you you've got your design down, always group together your objects because the grouping function will actually show what the design is actually going to look like. Right, without the void space that you put in. Precisely. So this this is my super super simple one. Uh, Brian, I sent you this, and you turned this into a three spoke. Did you you do you basically just took the rings I created, right? Yeah, so you sent me this uh, STL, and I brought it, copied it into Tinkercad, and basically I wanted mine to be look different, so right. I changed it to three. Um, but yeah, I used the same space circles uh, that you did because I knew we'd be using the same parts. But then uh, one of the things I added was, uh, it's actually one of the pieces in the Tinkercad um, on the side there with like the shapes. Mm, I think right. it's the donut. Uh, donut or circle, but I added that to the outside of the, s the cylinder so that the edges were rounded. Because uh, one of the complaints I had about your design, well, I actually know what I didn't have a complaint about. It. Jason Howell did. Oh. He, he said he was spinning it and he like oh, felt like he was going to cut his finger because the how, edge was sharp on it. How is that? I mean, he has his very, hands are has, bigger than my hands. Has, well, they're but they're soft. You know, they're tender. So... <laughs> So I added... I have farmer's hands. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have calluses on his like you do. Uh, so I added rounded edges to mine and reduced it to three. But the thing with uh, adding the rounded edges to it, I thought that I would be bringing the bearings in closer to the center that way. But in fact, it's actually the same distance from the center yep. to the, the outside, even though I reduced the size, but uh, the... Having that extra arch on the outside um, is actually the same distance away. So, yeah. from, so if you hand me your design real quick. If you go to the side shot, Bert, whoop, I think I can show it. <laughs> so there's Padres and then mine. Now, I will say I, I did make a five-spoke uh, version of this yeah. for one reason and one reason al alone. Why is that? Uh, it reminded me of the little weapon from Krull. What? What's Krull? You've never seen Krull? See, Burke knows Krull. Burke's laughing. It's, it's, it was a sci-fi movie from the from the eighties. <laughs> it was really bad, but it's got kind of a cult fiction. And How's the coolest spelled? thing was he had this little. It was like a throwing star with five points, and you could direct it with your magic. I don't see it here though. Did it work, or did your printer die? That's when the printer. Oh, died. Yeah. So I was printing bad. two designs last night, so I could have a bunch, and then the printer decided it didn't boo, want to cooperate. Yeah, boo on, boo on. Well, me. you know, my design went through a couple iterations too. This was, <laughs> this was my first, oh, hey, there it is. Is that it? That's it. That's that's the super weird uh, claw blade thingy. That looks dangerous. It's super, I, I actually made one when I was a kid out of razor blades, and it was <laughs> awesome to throw, 
But I'm like, oh, you have to catch it. <laughs> ah, don't do that. That's bad. Yeah. Uh, so when I first did my design, I knew I wanted to do the the rounded edges, but I didn't incorporate, I didn't take out the the braces that you had in the in between. Uh, so if you go to the side shot, Brooke, uh, you can see how much how much longer it was when I added the the circles to. I like long. I, I don't you I don't want a tiny little spinner. If I wanted a tiny little spinner, I'd buy one of those cheapies. But then you can only go so far before it hits the side of my palm. I have little baby hands, okay? This I is, can't this, this concerns me. How I don't <laughs> Your spinner works fine. I <laughs> for say, my hand. It works fine for my fine. hand too. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Burke, if you come back to my computer, I do want to show an, uh, something else and this is the prototype for the magnetic accelerator uh, cradle. So this, this is essentially what it looks like. I'm going to go ahead and drag these pieces out just a tiny bit so we can see what went into the design here. Pretty um, basic. Yeah. So this is, let me ungroup it. This is how it looks like when you ungroup it. That, these uh. are all the design elements that are required. Essentially, mm. I started with a block, and then I took out, using these four wedges, a bunch of material so that I could kind of open it up because I want to mm. actually be able to see the spinner rather than, than just uh, you know, hearing it spin. Uh, then I hollowed out the middle of it with this block. And then these, the round pieces, they created a uh, sort of a, a holding area. Let me go ahead and regroup this. A holding area so that I'd have a place to park that uh, the little hub. Remember the hub that we had? So this little, this right. little ridge holds it inside of the spinner. Now, the idea is eventually when this thing is done, there's going to be a little electromagnet in the base uh, out of sight. Mm -hmm. And it will be able to pulse the electromagnet at the uh, the right rate to pull down each of the magnetic bearings as it as it passes by. Right. And it should just slowly get faster and faster and faster. Okay. And if we do it right, you shouldn't notice any of the sensors, any of the magnets, or any of the power. So you can have it sitting on your desk and it will just keep spinning forever. That would be pretty cool. Right? But what other components are in, that you do you need for that? Because it will have to turn the magnet on and off, right? Yeah, so my initial design was a hall sensor. And a hall sensor, all, all it does is it it, uh, it can sense when it's near a metallic mass. Mm. And that worked. So you have the hall sensor on this side of the cradle and the magnet on this side of the cradle. And when, uh, if you, uh, let me borrow this. When, you, when the magnet, when the mass gets close to that side, it actually activates the electromagnet and pulls down the, the one on this side. Right. And it just repeats. That worked perfectly until... It spun f so fast that it was actually spinning faster than the reaction time of the hall sensor. And then it actually started slowing it down because the magnet was pulsing at the wrong time. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So what I'm probably going to do is, and it's way overkill because I know I could do this with a couple of transistors. Yeah. I'm going to build an Arduino into it and it right. will it'll actually adjust the parameters for me. That'll be a cool project though. And you've got plenty of Arduinos laying around. Yeah, I know. Gosh, right. All right. So let's go ahead and show you how we assemble these because it's they're super, super sensitive. They are super, super advanced. Folks, do not try this at home. <laughs> Actually, no, like please. most of our projects. <laughs> this is a very um, subtle project. You super to, subtle. Yeah, you have to use some finesse. Okay, okay. so here we have, if you go to my uh, my side view here, uh, Burke, uh, we've got my frame, and I need to put uh, four bearings. So I need this one. This is the special bearing, the one that's uh, that's without lubricant. And then these, these are bearings, but basically all I'm using them for is for ballast. They just need to provide weight mass to my spinner so that it will continue to spin. Now, I've pin printed the tolerances on this really tight because you don't want these bearings slipping out after you've put them in. Uh, so there's a there's a super um, sensitive installation method that we use to- uh, <laughs> Brute force. To put these in. So um, hold on, let me, uh, we have a special tool that we designed for just for this project mm -hmm. so that we could get these in there. Uh, so what you have to do is, uh, Brian, yeah. if you have to you steady, me, you, you can steady it. Hold it for yeah. you? Yeah, and okay. then, and then uh, I have to, hold on, let me calibrate the tool. Uh -huh. And ah, ah! <laughs> And so that, just do that very gently, super, super gently. Ah! And, uh, and there you go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, uh, that actually was a lot easier than what I had to go through. And yeah, could you show what happened to yours, Brian? Okay. Uh, not all 3D printers are created equal. Mine's the <laughs> Da Vinci, which is it's uh, three years old now. And it was like $300, I think, when it first came out. It was great for us to play around with. It was one of like the first consumer 3D printers of that course. you could have at yes. home and stuff. But the tolerances... Um, a little sloppy. Yeah. Yeah. My, so the problem I had with my print, which 
identical diameter circles. Uh, these bearings should have fit okay, but because the print head isn't as precise, uh, they weren't perfect circles. And when I tried placing the bearings into um, their holsters, basically <laughs> cracked the print in certain places. So you, places. Did, you didn't really need a hammer. It just kind of opened up for you. <sighs> I couldn't get them in otherwise. I tried to just do it by hand, but the time is just too tight and then i ended up shattering it so i know i want if you can print my model on one of your printers now broken printers not, once they're fixed <laughs> no, okay. uh, I, i'm curious i'm pretty sure it would work fine though <laughs> okay now uh, the, the last part of course uh again you can use them just like this so if you really wanted to, to save a bunch of money right now if i could buy the bearings uh, just one off so instead mm -hmm. of buying them in a pack this cost a total of a dollar forty, I think, uh, including the filament. That's assuming, of course, you have a three D printer. Right. But this is this is sort of an expensive piece because it's machine, but it does make all the difference. This is what makes your spinner a little nicer than uh, just any. This is a metallic, uh, actually a brass machine cap. It goes. It fits the diameter of the bearing perfectly, and then what it does is not only does it now give me a place. To, uh, to put my fingers instead of the bearing, but it fits my cradle. So now I can have this in the cradle. Spinners spin, in the cradle. Spin, 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 spin. In a silver spoon. Yeah, how about that? Well, and also you could you could try this spinner um, without the weights and just see how how much of a difference yeah, that actually, makes, that's, right? that's a good, there, let me see if I can. Oh. What? I, yeah. Here you can. Uh. You can use mine. Oh, there we go. Okay. But, <laughs> wait, it should work. Uh, maybe I didn't tighten it down all it's the a, way? It's, that's a different cradle. Oh, okay. Slightly different cradle. Okay, so, like, here, no weights. It does spin, but what you're going to find is, see how fast it, it slows down? It doesn't have as much inertia at the end. Yeah, because there's, there's no mass. There's yeah. no mass on the outer ring. Versus, oh, actually, here, this is what we'll do. Side by side. Side by side. So, it's, it's kind of a cool little physics experiment, too. And it, I actually gave that much much more of a spin. So let's see which one's going to slow down first. Uh, yeah, that's pretty inevitable. It just right. it can't store as much energy. And it also, if you try moving the spinner while it's moving like that, you'll start to feel the inertial effect, like the it's gyroscopic, like gyroscopic effect right. of it. Yeah. And uh, and remember, these are exactly the same. The, what, what Brian has here and what I have here, these are exactly the same. Same design, same cradle, same hub. The only difference is that this... This one has these skate bearings on the outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this particular case, weight is good. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we're going to move on from this because the next we want to show you spinners, and which, by the way, I have to say, I hated doing this project. Why? But I kind of liked doing this project. <laughs> it's like a guilty pleasure. It really is, right? Yeah. It's so stupid. It really is so stupid. And yet, I am told this is coming with me on retreat. I'm just going to be sitting there praying and going, huh. Well, it, and it's just so hyped right now, you know? Like, you, you see the news, and it's like, spinners taking over our schools. Yeah. Uh, all right. We actually ban spinners at the school I live at. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, you're building them. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Um, That's bad. <laughs> I don't know. And when I he used to hear the word spinners, I always thought of the things that people put on their wheels that were super irritating. Right. Oh, uh -oh. We could put a spinner in a spinner so it keeps spinning even after it stops spinning. Please don't. Yeah, it's One spinner is no, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, when we come back, uh, I do want to show another bit of technology that we're going to be including in the magnetic accelerator version of this project when I come back in August. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment for these messages. You know, folks... Here at Know How, we are all about the knowledge. I mean, it's it's in the name of our program. In order to get the knowledge, however, we, we often have to open up the devices, the projects, the gadgets that we play with. And that's how we learn, how things are put together. It's, it's part of that maker DIY DNA. But in order to do that, you need the right tools. I mean, Brian, you, you've been here right before where you, you try to use a, uh, a flat <laughs> screwdriver to pry open a case. Oh, more more times than I would like to admit. And what happens when you do that? I break things. You break things. You I make mar it the case. You make it worse. And that's because we are often using the wrong tools. The right tool makes all the difference, which is why we love the fact that iFixit is a sponsor of Know How. How iFixit is... Well, a company that you should be familiar with because their teardowns are all over the internet. They take apart stuff and they teach you how to fix your things. 
They're constantly posting teardowns and repair videos for popular devices like the Galaxy S8, the iPhone, and even the Switch. They needed better tools to get the job done. They were just like us. They were always very frustrated with the limited number of tools that were designed for people who needed to get in and out of projects. And so they created the iconic Black and Blue ProTech Toolkit. The ProTech Toolkit is fully loaded with everything you need for your next fix or DIY project. They've just dropped the price to $59.95. And don't let the sleek design fool you. This toolkit's got both beauty and brawn with high-quality steel bits and tools tough enough to handle any repair or mod you throw at them. The tool roll makes it compact and easy to store, and it includes a 64-bit driver kit. That's an updated kit from their last one that has all the bits you need for just about any DIY electronics repair. It also has a protective case that keeps your bits organized. You can open it up and flip it over, and the bits won't fall out because... It's held in place by a magnetic mat, which also doubles as the perfect spot to hold those tiny components and screws so you don't accidentally, accidentally bump the table and splash your project all over the place. They've also included accessories like a swivel top magnetic precision driver and a flex extension to get you into those hard-to-reach places to grab those hard-to-reach screws and bolts. They've also got a wide variety of plastic opening tools, spudgers, and picks to safely poke and pry with, as well as a suction cup with a brand new fancy dangled handle to remove display assemblies. iFix's own rubber-handed Jimmy Pry tool is included in the kit, as well as a set of metal spudgers. Now, they have also got a set of ESD safe tweezers and an ESD safety strap so that you can safely open up your electronics without and destroying the job with a static shock. And the best part, iFixit tools are backed by iFixit's lifetime warranty. You don't need to buy something to get iFixit's free repair resources. They've got over 25,000 free, completely free repair guides over at iFixit.com. So folks, if you are looking at your next toolkit, or maybe you need a gift for that DIY or maker in your family, you're going to want to try iFixit. If you want to tackle your next hack, fix, or build with the ProTech toolkit, you can go over to iFixit.com slash twit and we'll, got, we'll give you a code that will give you $5 off. That's right, ifixit.com slash twit and use the code KNOWHOW at checkout to save $5 on your purchase of $10 or more. Once again, ifixit.com slash twit and the code KNOWHOW. And we thank ifixit for their support of KNOWHOW. Okay, Brian, so we've got our spinners. Got our spinners. Even though our printers decided that they were so disgusted they didn't want to print the spinners. Well, your printers were disgusted. Mine just wasn't capable. Your, your printer was just like, um, eh, please the, don't. <laughs> the sad kid in the back of the classroom is just trying to keep up with everyone. Kind of. So but, sad. you know, it still works. It's, it's again, cool for fast yeah. prototyping, Absolutely. but it's not as precise for something that yeah. needs to rotate like this. Yeah. But what we want to do is we want to look forward. And one of the things that we're going to need for our project, for our magnetic spinner, mm -hmm. is some sort of power source, something that can be molded so that it doesn't look like a power source. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What would it be? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it might be this new battery technology that we saw from Panasonic at CES 2017. One of the big trends of the last three CESs has been the Internet of Things and wearable technologies. We love having our devices with us at all time, but the question becomes, how do we power them? I mean, even the most svelte pair of glasses, even the best AR headset, even the best wearable technology needs to get its power from somewhere, and that battery is often the bulkiest part of the item. Well, what if I told you that Panasonic had come up with a way to make the lithium-ion battery not just flexible, but far more durable than those in the past? That's why I'm speaking with Yuriko from Panasonic, who's going to explain what they've done for flexible ion technology. Yuriko, yes. now, this idea of the flexible battery has been difficult. Why is it difficult to make a battery that can bend? Yeah, if we bend uh, batteries repeatedly, the capacity uh, decreased, yeah, it means the operating time will shorter than before. But we can develop this kind of battery. Yeah. So this battery, uh, when we bend or twist repeatedly, we can maintain the capacity. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly, because lithium-ion batteries are essentially they're bags of chemistry, and if you if you break that bag, you get a runaway reaction, and we've all seen what can happen with runaway reactions. Just ask the good people over at Samsung. But with this battery, I can deflect up to 25 millimeters, and it's not going to have any ill effect. Now, this this capacity, of course, is going to be smaller than a standard battery, right? Yeah, it's very smaller one. Yeah, we are targeting for IoT or wearable devices. Yeah, it's so very suitable for these kind of applications. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking about. Uh, you said about 100 milliamp hour would be the the maximum, but I could use multiple cells. If if I were to make say some sort of a wearable technology, I could have cells in different places, and they'd all be as flexible as one big cell. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, uh, yes, it's different. Now there's another part to this, and that is the charging, because I can't use standard wireless charging. We all know about Qi charging. Qi would provide too much voltage, too much current to this. Correct. Yes, uh, Qi standard is not suitable for this kind of small rechargeable battery, but our uh, wireless charging system is suitable for this pin-type flexible batteries. Yeah. Okay, so I got to ask, where do you see this, this technology being applied? We're going to see it in wearables, we're going to see it in the Internet of Things, but where does Panasonic want this technology to be next year or the year after? Where would you like to see the thin, flexible batteries exist? Oh, yeah, this battery is still under development, but we are trying to go into the market uh, in 2018. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, if they wanted to find out more about the flexible thin film ion batteries, if they wanted to find out more about their, your, your new charging techniques, where should they go on the internet? Oh, sorry? Oh, uh, uh, Panasonic.com? That guy, uh, yeah, Panasonic.com, yeah, please uh, contact us, <laughs> yeah. Yuriko, thank you, you've been a sport. I, I understand that you know English is not your first language, but you've developed a great technology here. Folks, if you're looking for the next generation of wearables and the Internet of Things, the future is flexible. You know, uh, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I I had a great conversation with her before, right? And she was actually one of the engineers. She's one of the engineering leads who developed the technology, and so yeah. she really wanted to talk to me. And I'm like, I, I know your English is not great. Are, are you okay? And she's like, Yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And then yeah. she got very nervous. It's not easy being in front it's of the totally camera not. like that. It's really, especially at a place like CES, where yeah. there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of press. It's probably like the the tenth news crew that she right. talked to that that event but i mean when you get to the nitty-gritty she knew about oh, the technology yeah. she developed it i mean off camera cool. when when she didn't have to worry about being you know good right. for the camera anymore she she went into the technology and they've got something because if you can take standard lithium poly uh technology and make it so that i can incorporate it into clothing or into a strange shape yeah and not have to worry about any of those thermal runaways that's that's amazing. That's astounding. And that's the thing about their technology. It's not just that you can make it super thin. It's like you could pound on this with a hammer. You could mm -hmm. poke it with a nail. It will not burn. It it doesn't have a runaway problem like like you do with standard lithium poly uh, cells. Right. That's that's cool tech. Definitely. And then we wouldn't have to have any issue with uh, travel bans and stuff like that, right. where we can't have to have our laptops or cell phones on the plane with us because right. if we could stop them from igniting. That would get that would rid of the nice. issue. Now, specifically, where I want to use it, and Burke, we've got a link up in the uh, the, the section above it from Spark Fun. If you could go ahead and, and go there, this I thought my magnetic accelerator was was kind of cool. There, yeah. It turns out someone has already been working on this. Uh, Burke, if you go and go to that, this is his version of it. So he built it into a glove, so it's a wearable, <laughs> and the magnet's actually in his finger oh it's like a power glove from a uh, nintendo it's so bad i like it because it's so bad it's it's a <laughs> lot of work for something really it is, nerdy it is super nerdy but, but i like I mean, it come on <laughs> who wouldn't who wouldn't want to be able to just go oh i've got the power of motion in my finger yeah. Come on. The more Come you talk on. about it, the Be less honest. I want to do it. You, you're not the salesman for it. No. Damn that. It's, it's the same thing. Hey, people who wear VR goggles outside, they look awesome. That's true. They look incredible. Right. Right. <laughs> it's the future, everyone. You can't escape it. There was that, uh, the, we did that demo at IFA. Mm -hmm. where there was the, the virtual reality shoot em up. And so I was on a stage and I was running around and I, oh, I'm you like, thought oh, you were so this is, cool. This is, I'm like, oh, I'm shooting like this. Yep. And then I saw the video. I'm like, oh my oh. God. Oh. oh. 
What it's it even looks worse. Like, it looks like out of shape fat guy having some sort of seizure in front of <laughs> well, like a thousand people. It's like almost worse when people catch you dancing like on your own, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> except you're wearing gear. Like, oh. uh, folks, when we come back, uh, we want to bring you one more thing that we're we're looking at doing into the future. Um, you may remember, Ryan, a, a while back mm -hmm. we did a submerged technology episode where we took mineral oil and we we actually put a computer running Linux. Yeah into a vat of mineral oil it, it kept running and it worked perfectly just never don't ever take it back out don't ever take it back out mess. and which by the way i made i actually turned that into a working project oh um and we were going to show it on know-how except for the fact that when you put wires into mineral oil they become wicks and the mineral oil ends up in weird weird places i had mineral oil in the power plug connected into the wall it, it actually had wicked all the way through the, through the computer up into the power supply, down into the power cable, and started dripping at the power socket. I'm like, this is not good. Well, it's non-conductive, so shouldn't be an issue. But it's, the mineral oil is non-conductive, uh, but, but everything it might that pick attaches up to debris. It. Yeah, yeah and if any good. moisture gets uh, attached to it, oof. Yeah. Oof. Well, what if I told you that there was still a way to do that project mm -hmm. and not worry about you know death, destruction, and fire? I say there's no possible way that's well, true. We're gonna find out in just a bit, but first, let's take a moment for these messages. Previously on Twit. Brian, one of the things that uh, we have to watch out for, because we're geeks, is exposure. This is the Winterio pop-up tent. Unclip it, and then you just go, oh, I want a house. Boom. Boom, and that's what you got. This Week in Law. Kiss and frankly, a variety of rock bands over the last several decades have used the devil horn sign. I guess some debate whether the thumb should be out or not. Gene Simmons has filed a trademark application to trademark that, claiming that he came up with it on his own. I think the court can take judicial notice of the fact that Ronnie James Dio invented the devil horns. I think there's prior art here. This week in Enterprise Tech. This is actually an interesting one and a bit scary for any person who wears or needs modern day medical devices. After reviewing seven pacemaker products from four different vendors, they were able to find 10 security vulnerabilities that most of them shared. And then also found that from the components that they're actually made up of included 8,600 security flaws. They're concentrate on the medicine, which God bless them. That's what they really should be but they really and truly need to bring in security specialists as part of the design process. Twit, making the world safe for technology. And we are back. Okay, so if you remember from the Submerge project, yeah. the, the, the thing was to get non-dialectic fluid. Right. Right, because you want fluid that doesn't conduct. But unlike mineral oil, we don't want something that's so viscous. In fact, mm -hmm. the ideal fluid would, you could evaporate it and then allow it condense to condense because that really pulls away heat. The, because the problem with mineral oil is, yes, it will pull heat away from the components until the mineral oil is at the same temperature as the components. Right. And right. unfortunately, the boiling temperature of mineral oil is above the melting temperature of most of the components on your motherboard. Right. So you needed something like a, a, a pump. It's to something to circulate it. Circulate it uh, and get get all of the heat away from, from the container. That's right. Isn't the idea behind it that the mineral oil is more dense than air, so you can it can absorb more heat quicker more quickly than if you were to use air, but you have to you move need that a way, some yeah, way. You need to a way to remove the heat. Otherwise, yeah. it just keeps building and building and building. And instead of a submerged computer, you have a deep fryer. <laughs> that sounds delicious. That's very delicious. Mm. But instead, what if we took a look at some technology that 3M has developed to help those people who are trying to develop exotic cooling? Let's take a trip back to CES and take a look at Novak. Be you a system builder or an enterprise guru, there's one common enemy, heat. Heat is the thing that causes inefficiency. Heat is the thing that causes equipment to break, which is why I'm here with Philip from 3M, who has a novel idea for the next generation of data centers. Philip, what is this? This is evaporative two-phase immersion cooling. So the server has been submerged in a dielectric coolant that has a boiling temperature of about 55 C. Fluid's boiling on the heat generating components, the GPUs, CPUs. 
All the heat's gathered as a vapor stream that moves upward, condensing on a coil, transfers heat to facility water. Everything within the tank is passive. Now, there are people who are passing by who are thinking, why are they putting bubbles through the bottom of this tank? Those aren't bubbles. Well, they are bubbles, but it's not an air supply. That's actually the liquid boiling as it comes into contact with those hot surfaces. And of course, thermodynamics tell us that that energy must come from somewhere, which means it's dumping all its waste heat directly into this Novec. Now, the cool thing about this, and this has been sort of the dream of anyone who's been building a high density data center, is it allows you to precisely control where the heat goes. It doesn't go into the hot aisle, it doesn't go outside of the rack, it goes to where we want to go, which in this case is the condensing unit. How, how would I scale this? Because I love this idea, but what would I need to do to, to do this on a massive center? I'm talking about a data center the size of, say, the South Hall. That's a very good question, and it's being done today. Uh, in fact, Bitfury, one of our customers, has deployed at the 40 megawatt scale in a Bitcoin mining facility in the Republic of Georgia. It houses about 6 million ASICs in 250 kilowatt tanks. And they run that facility with 48 to 52 degrees C facility water. So their annual energy consumption for cooling is approximately 1% of the IT overhead. And the facility was built in six months on, on what would be a shockingly low budget in the IT industry. All right, now let's get past the geek factor because I love this kind of cooling. Immersive cooling has always been something that's, it's a little bit of a geek squee. I mean, be, be you the, the guy who built his first system himself or someone who's designing a data center, anytime I can use a non-traditional way of cooling, which tends to be a, a very large chunk of my power usage, I'm happy. And yet, this is still pretty specialized because it's going to be a little bit more costly. Who do you see being the customer for Novec? Who's going to be designing something using this kind of evaporative cooling? Well, we have to find those partners that are that have a sore point, right? They need the density that the technology can provide. They need the energy efficiency. Perhaps people who are constrained in, in real estate, floor space density, and energy for cooling. Um, but before that can happen, we have to work with partners like Gigabyte here uh, to densify the hardware, to reduce the fluid requirement to submerge the hardware. Before that, the cost of ownership model is not very attractive, but, but it quickly gets that way when you, when you increase density. All right, I'm going to have to ask you to look into your crystal ball because I remember working with Floor Inert and Cray Computers because you used to have to liquid cool those. Now we've got Novec. What comes next? What, what, is the, what are the wizards at 3M working on in the lab that's just going to blow away those who are looking for a better way to cool their hot gear? Well, our expertise, of course, is the chemistry, and we're always looking at better chemistries. Uh, key factors are safety, environment, low global warming potential. The Novec trade name, the fluids that we use today, are all intended, all of those products are intended to meet those goals. Um, and we, we continue to think about the future. How do, we, how do we meet the demands of HPC with their you know, high, high communication frequencies? We need low dielectric constants. Um, all these things are important. Philip, thank you very much. You've, just, you've made my CES. Now, if they wanted to find out more about Novec, if they wanted to find out more about 3M, if they wanted to find out more about the applications for this kind of technology, where should they go? I would say go online and Google two-phase immersion cooling. You'll find a lot of information. That's 3M. If you're looking for a way to cool down, maybe you just need to dunk it in some Novec. We've got people in the chat room who are wondering about, well, you know, it's, it's expensive. I said, yes, it's, it's very expensive. Yeah. But here's the thing. It's about the third of the price of Flow Inert, which was the 3M product beforehand that, that mm. did this. And the other thing is it's non-toxic. In fact, that demonstration unit that they had, you could actually reach into it. You could put your hand into the liquid. I saw you do that. And come out completely dry. That yeah. was, that's cool for a lot of reasons. One, Literally, literally, cool. it's cool. But two, it means that if I need to service the the, the machines, mm -hmm. there will be no trace of Novec left on them. Once I drain the reservoir, it's as if I'm just working on a regular computer case, which is nice. Right. You don't. You're not left with that uh, gross residue and mm -hmm. stuff on yeah, things. Yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot of people are pointing out too, like, oh, this is so crazy expensive for for cooling, and it's like, well. Maybe if this is your home PC, it would be, but yeah. I imagine for like a giant enterprise. This In a data center, this is a godsend because what we want to do is we want the highest density server racks possible. The limiting factor, well, there's two of them. Power, how much power can you provide to the rack, which we are, we are solving by having far more efficient uh, components nowadays. But the second thing is heat. They're all going to generate heat. Yeah. And if you don't have enough cooling going through your racks, you just destroy the equipment. What this can actually do is if you have a rack filled with blade after blade after blade after blade, mm -hmm. that the thermodynamics of having it submerged 
will guarantee that the heat will just rise to the top automatically. Right. And then you can use a um, a closed cycle to, to remove that heat. And, and the nice thing about the closed cycle, you don't have to do anything exotic. You basically put a coil at the top, like an air conditioning coil. Right. The Novec evaporates, it hits the coil, it condenses and falls back in. Yeah, it's a perfect little recycling system. Precisely. And so anytime you're trying to increase efficiency, especially in something like a data center, what you're looking for is can you control where the heat is coming out? That's the number one use of power in a data center today. Yeah. And with Novec, I can control exactly where I'm cooling it, exactly where the heat's going. And that means I can plan my data center much better. And anytime I can do that, it means... I'm saving a lot of money. And on the plus side, it looks really cool when you put it in a demonstration uh, plexiglass case like that. Right. Because, I, I mean, we were probably there for about 10, 15 minutes doing the interview, and five of those minutes was just spent of me, like, <laughs> it drooling. Look, it looks so cool with the uh, bubbles coming up, and you get to see all the components and stuff. Like, that. that is, like, computer art to me. And the reason why we showed this is because uh, I just recently did a gig at a data center down at Sunnyvale, and uh, the client that I was working with, um, they have a, have a rack of Novak cooled stuff. Nice. And in lieu of payment, I said, will you give me five gallons of Novak? And they're like, yeah, okay. I'm like, Ooh. so I have five gallons of that stuff. I, I'm going to plan what I do with it. Yeah. Uh, which means I need to come up with some sort of cooling loop. Cooling uh, but, loop, some contained system. Yeah. But their cooling loop was awesome because it was it was just um, uh, not even tap water. It was chill water. Oh. So it was from uh, like a fan unit up in the uh, on the roof. Yeah. It just ran chill water through the, uh, the coil and yeah. that was enough to condense the Novak. Very cool. I like cool that stuff. idea. And, huh. and of course, you know, if I'm going to build a system out of this and it's a liquid, I'm going to need LEDs. Uh, well, clearly. I mean, if you're going to be able to put something <laughs> like that underwater, you're going to want to light it up. I just, I, I, I'm going to be having a computer case in where the liquid inside the case is going to be worth like five times more than the, <laughs> the, the components being used. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. It's fun. It happens. Uh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information for you to try to uptake in a very short amount of time. And so we're going to make it easy for you to get our notes, including, yes, we are giving you uh, the link. In fact, we're doing something a little bit differently for this project. We're actually going to give you the link for my design. Rather than giving you the files, this means that you can take my design, copy it, mm -hmm. and then change it on your own. You, you want to make the little crawl thing? You could do that. You want to make one of Brian's three-spoke things so that it could shatter into a million pieces the first time you spin it? If I had a better printer, it would be fine and far superior to your, your square edges that cut people's fingers. You know, it is a poor artist who blames his tools. Wow. Says the guy who has the three hundred dollar printer, and I've got I, the, <laughs> the not, Da Vinci. Not, but hey, that was a three hundred dollar printer three years it was, ago. Was like, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you can find everything at our show notes. And Brian, where do they find those? You can find those at twit.tv slash kh. And not only will you find all the links of the stuff that we talked about today, but if you haven't already, you can download the episode or subscribe. Yes, and also don't forget that you can find us on the socials. Specifically at Google+. Plus, Just go to Google+, Plus, look for know-how, ask to join. Very short approval process to keep out the spam accounts. But once you're in, you get access to over 11,000 kitas. Those are our know-it-alls, the people who you can ask questions of. Maybe you can answer a couple of questions. And perhaps while you're there, you could drop us pictures, videos, and descriptions of your projects and questions so that we can show them here right on the show. That's right. And if you want to find out what we're doing outside of the show and know when we're having spin-offs or project offs, the best place to find out about that is on Twitter. And I am at cranky underscore hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And we've got a third member of our crew who... That's right. I think this is the first time he's ever TD'd know-how. I feel like it has to be. It has to be, right. Because we normally have... We've had a couple of other standbys. Yeah, uh, his name's Alex Gumpel. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds just, it sounds like, just you, like Alex. No, no, there's not enough, not enough scowl. In that voice to be, yeah. Excuse yeah, me, it's... Padre. Okay, see, now we're getting closer. Too gruff. It's grumple. <laughs> it's too deep and gruff. Uh, Folks, Alex just sounds miserable. You know him. You love him. You uh, you may have heard of him as Burke, the originator of Burke Chat. So, uh, yeah, Burke's pushing our buttons today. Yes, he is. And he did a great job. He did. Thanks, Burke. Uh, until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how. Keep on spinning. Of course, me a lot longer than him. Whatever. Unless I do this. Oh. Boom. Destroyed. <laughs> Spin now. <laughs> <laughs>